Robert McDonald. Uh, and so uh, Dr. McDonald is a lead scientist for nature-based solutions at the Nature Conservancy. He researches the impact and dependencies of communities on the natural world, studying how nature can increase resilience in the face of climate change and improve human health and well-being. He holds a PhD in ecology from Duke University and has published more than 70 scientific publications and two books. Prior to joining the Conservancy, he was a Smith Conservation Biology Fellow at Harvard University, so studying it, the impact uh, global urban growth will have on biodiversity and conservation. He also taught landscape ecology at Harvard's Graduate School of Design, helping architects and planners incorporate ecological principles into their projects. And um, if you guys have questions throughout this talk, feel free to throw them in the chat uh, or brave souls can unmute themselves at the end and ask uh, Dr. McDonald. And with that, I will turn it over to you. All right, thank you all for the invitation and thank you all for being here. Um, it's gonna be an interesting seminar to give because I, it's everything from uh, probably folks who don't know much about this topic and I'll, I'll pitch my talk at that level. And then folks like, um, I see Eric Greenfield from, from USDA who are experts in, in parts of this topic. Um, so the title of my talk, I'm gonna share my slides here, is, um, can someone give me a heads up that you can see the slides? They look good. All right, thank you. Is mapping tree inequality. So why do many people not benefit from tree cover and why it matters for, for climate change and for COVID? So what I'll try to do in probably half the time today, because I want to leave a lot of time for talking, is talk about first, you know, what is nature in cities? Why does it matter? Um, and then really focus in on two papers that my group came out with recently. One is around tree cover inequality and heat for a sample of US cities, um, about 6,000 US cities. And then in part two, look at tree cover inequality, but also actually park access inequality and how it relates to patterns of COVID-19 case count. Uh, and then I'm gonna try to end with just a slide or two on how we might fix the, the, the inequality that's there and, and what the public policy solutions might, might be. So I thought I'd start with the big picture. Uh, this is the world we, we live in uh, at night. Um, this is the US at night from, from space. So you can really see all of our cities, all of our towns and, and communities, and even the highways um, stretching between them. Humanity is a majority urban species. We've been that way for probably close to a decade now, depending on who you believe. And there'll be another 2 billion urban dwellers in cities by, uh, by 2050. So to get your head around how big a transformation that is, um, picture a city, uh, I don't have the, the stats in hand for your city, but picture city the size of New York City, all of the roads and bridges, um, and picture building all that in about uh, three months, <laughs> and then sort of doing that again and again and again out to 2050. That's roughly the pace of urban building and, and infrastructure construction that we as a species are undertaking. But of course, it, it won't all be in one spot. It'll be scattered across all of these pinprick flights around the world surface. But by one estimate, we might urbanize an area that's the size of the state of Texas by, by 2050 of new urban area. So it's a really fundamental change to the Earth's land surface and all those people in cities need resources as well. So one of the, the overarching questions of my research is what is the purpose of the conservation movement where I work in an urban world like that? In this urban century we find ourselves in of the, the fastest migration into cities in, in human history. And when I talk to conservationists um, or ecologists and, and you talk about cities, they think about a space like this. Um, this is the Los Angeles River, which is sort of the poster child of a river that has lost all of its ecological function. Uh, for anyone who's seen the, the Terminator movies, this is a, a place where there were you know, fight scenes. Um, it, it occupies a certain interesting place in the psyche of Los Angeles. It's also a river that lost its identity for a long time. So it, this has been re-engineered as a stormwater conveyance system. And in fact, on maps in the city for several decades, this stopped being called a river and was just called the, the Los Angeles stormwater conveyance system. So it's a good example of a single function solution um, that engineers might come up with for a river that 
uh, is a gray, lifeless space. So if this is what that urban future looks like, I think for myself and, and many others, it, that's a depressing sort of future. So I want to tell you the story of another place. Uh, this is Seoul, South Korea, um, and very typical post-World War II development along another river. And it's a, this river is totally hidden. This is the Shangdishang River underneath that highway, you can see. And um, this is that space today. So at very great expense, the city decided to remove that highway and rehabilitate this site. Um, so this is not nature the way some of my Nature Conservancy colleagues might, might talk about it, right? These are not wild species. A landscape architect chose all the species that were reintroduced into this space. But, you know, fish have returned to this river, and so there's some extra biodiversity value. This is still the um, stormwater conveyance system of Seoul. So in high flood times, you, you do have to get out of this space. But it's now also a big linear park that helps cool this portion of the city and serves as a place for uh, recreation and, and mental health in the city. So for people like me who um, went and got a, a PhD in ecology, um, I did not get that PhD thinking I would be interacting with cities as they plan nature-based solutions like this one. But increasingly, I, I think ecologists are being asked to, to engage in th this question of what should our cities look like? How does nature shape the, the lives of us in cities? And I think that's a really exciting change and sort of a paradigm shift in how we think about nature. So we're not just thinking about protecting nature from humans and from cities, although that's still a really important agenda, but we're also thinking about um, how nature can improve life in cities. So I'm gonna give you a quick tour of the kinds of projects the Nature Conservancy does in cities. And I don't mean this to be an advertisement for the Nature Conservancy, but rather kind of a, a recognition that there's many different kinds of nature-based solutions in cities for many different purposes. Before I really focus in on some, some hardcore science around tree cover. So this is the, the goal of what we're trying to do in cities and in communities. Um, we really believe you have to harmonize the relationship between cities and nature so that both of them can thrive, so that there's still space for biodiversity in that urban century, and that those cities are green, um, thriving, thriving places. So one thing we do in lots of cities, including Melbourne, which you see here, is just sort of classic open space planning or um, sometimes urban canopy plans like we did in, in the greater Melbourne area. Um, it focused often on biodiversity. This, this plan had a particular focus on biodiversity, but also sometimes benefits to people, heat island mitigation, recreation, et cetera. Stormwater, stormwater is another big focus of um, projects, especially I would say in the US and, and China, we see a lot of focus on nature-based solutions for stormwater. This is a example from Bridgeport, Connecticut, which is sort of neat because it's also a gardening space. Um, so it's both rainwater from the road you can see to the right and a, and a gardening space. There's increasingly a really big focus on um, heat mitigation. Uh, and this will be a theme for the, the second parts of my talk. And I, I thought I'd include a picture here from Phoenix, Arizona of a community tree planting in a park. Phoenix is a particularly interesting example because it's an arid climate. Right, so every tree you plant, you have to be thoughtful of the water demands of, of that tree. There's also interest in um, air quality uh, and planning for trees for air quality. I included a picture here from Louisville, Kentucky, one of our field projects where there's, there's kind of the greatest focus there. And this one's particularly interesting to me because there's a, a project we've been trying to work on with the University of Louisville with some NIH money where we're treating tree planting as a public health intervention and tracking health outcomes over time. And finally, there's that human dimension I mentioned. Um, th these are some students in the Boston area who are working on a paid internship over the summer to collect data. Um, so we're using that data for management of, of a preserve, but this is also important for us um, in terms of a way to connect uh, students to, to nature. And, and for many of them, the, this is their first opportunity to spend a summer um, outdoors. 
So we'll do lots of other things in this category. I won't have time to mention around education. And so there's that other dimension, I guess, of connecting people with nature. And so just keep that in mind as I talk. All right, so tree cover. Um, I hope you, you bore with me on those preliminaries. We're gonna spend the rest of this talk talking about tree cover, which is arguably the most important kind of nature in cities because it provides this big suite of benefits. And that's what this graphic is meant to convey. So everything from um, reducing heat, which, which we'll focus in on especially here, to air quality, to property values, uh, et cetera. So cities want to try to plan for this suite of benefits that, that urban tree canopy can provide. So transitioning to one problem and, and one paper I want to talk to you about today, it, you know, if trees are so wonderful, why aren't they everywhere? Uh, and, and how unequal is tree cover in the US? I thought I'd ease into this topic by giving you a picture of Washington DC. So a city I lived in for, for many years. The top right here is a um, lower income, so poorest quartile of, of households, neighborhood in DC. Um, and the bottom right is a, a top quartile of households neighborhood. I picked these examples intentionally because these are both brick post-rural apartment, apartment buildings in DC. So very typical construction. But you can see the top is um, renter occupied and the management company here has chosen to just have a lawn. It's very cheap to maintain. The bottom right is a rent is an owner occupied building, and you can see they've allowed this big tree canopy to grow up. So on average in DC, 11 percentage point difference in tree cover between the richest quartile and the, and the poorest quartile of households. And there's been, a, a, I want to acknowledge, a huge number of studies in the US that have shown this um, in particular cities or, or particular sets of cities. Um, so what we are trying to do with this study was really look at as big a sample of, of communities as we could with some high resolution data and get a sense of you know, how big is the overall tree canopy gap? How much fewer trees do poor neighborhoods have? How much does it relate to, to income and race and ethnicity? What does that mean for summer surface temperatures? So we're, we're using some Landsat data to assess that. And finally, what might that mean for, for health and, and how could we correct that? So our study universe here was the 100 largest urbanized areas in the US. Uh, and each urbanized area has dozens and dozens of cities or municipalities. So you can get a sense that there's around 5,273 cities or other census defined places um, within those 100 urbanized areas. And what we did then is use NAEP imagery to pull out a consistent two meter resolution tree cover map across those cities uh, with some training data that actually the Dave Nowak at the Forest Service uh, shared with us. So I wanna acknowledge that some cities, including I think the city you're sitting in now have much higher resolution um, products for tree canopy cover derived, for instance, from LIDAR. Um, and our, our product here was not an attempt in any way to replace those, but rather just have a consistent tree cover product that we could use uh, across many, many cities at once. And this just gives you a sense of visually what this data looks like. So you can go everything everywhere from the, the New York City metro area in the top left to looking at tree cover in specific places. So the, the bottom right here is Central Park and the, the reservoir in Central Park. And you can start to see individual tree canopies uh, on the Upper West Side there. So to me, the remote sensing story, I won't dwell on it much here, but it's exciting because this is a project that five years ago even, probably we would not have tried to do, but because of cloud computing capacities like in Google Earth Engine or, or others, um, Microsoft Azure, you, you can do projects like this fairly, fairly easily because storage space is no longer really a constraint and um, uh, computational capacity is no longer really a strong constraint. Okay, I'm gonna jump straight to some results and, and to the, the punchline here. So essentially to answer that first question I showed you, this phenomenon of high income neighborhoods having more tree cover than low income neighborhoods is almost everywhere. In 92% of American communities, uh, this trend holds that high income neighborhoods have more tree cover. So you should be asking yourself, well, okay, well, why is that? 
So one important gradient to keep your head around is this gradient in population density going from uh, dense neighborhoods in the city center out to less dense neighborhoods in, in the suburbs. And so we've broken the neighborhoods in, in US cities here into population density categories. And these are expressed as people per square kilometer, but I'll, I'll walk you through roughly what they mean. So anything above 8,000 people per square kilometer is multi-story apartment buildings generally. Um, something in the moderate category might be townhouses. By the time you're in low or very low population density categories, these breaks correspond with single family residential homes on different size lots. Okay, so that's what the rows are. And the bottom row here is all um, census blocks in the US. So look at the first column. This is percent tree cover splitting, looking at the, the bottom quartile of income and the top quartile of income. Um, so if you look at the very bottom row across all census blocks, there's about a 15 percentage point difference between low income and high income places. So low income neighborhoods have 20% tree cover, high income neighborhoods have about 35% tree cover. Um, now, if you start to look at the, the rows above by population density category, you'll see that in percent terms, there's actually the biggest difference in the suburbs, um, which surprised us, and, and less of a difference in the city center. In fact, it flips a little bit. So to explain what's going on here, look at the next category, the next column, which is population within that um, density category. And so you can see that high income households live in the suburbs in the US. They live at low population densities generally. Um, so there's 23 million high income households in the very low population density category within our sample of cities. Conversely, low income households live in um, predominantly moderate to high population density conditions. So that this structural issue is, is partially what's driving. It's not the only thing, and we'll get into many other factors that matter, but part of what's going on is that when you live at a low population density, there is more tree cover on average, and rich households tend to be in, in the suburbs. The last column is just to show the area in each of these categories. There's much more area spatially in suburbs than in city centers. So there's actually a lot more trees there overall because there's just a lot more, more area. So this is a more graphical way to look at some of that spatial trend um, from uh, across income, but also from city center to, to suburbs. So the x-axis here is the income quartile with Q1 being the lowest and Q4 being the, the highest, 25% of households. And the black line here is forest cover. So I sort of talked already about that trend as you get higher income in the US pretty consistently, you have more tree cover. And the green line is population density. So you can see there's a strong inverse relationship between these two. Interestingly, households in the suburbs are older on average. So people as they get wealthier tend to move out to the, the suburbs. Um, and they're also whiter. And, and by white here, I mean percent non-Hispanic white. So there's a strong correlation, uh, not surprisingly in the US, between income and, and race or ethnicity uh, for many, many reasons. But that is, th these two trends go with each other, the, the inequality of tree cover with respect to income and the inequality of tree cover with respect to race and ethnicity. Okay, I'm a landscape ecologist, so I love to just show comparative patterns between cities. I'm gonna show you a little bit of that. This is um, something that's, that's probably not too surprising. This is median tree cover in cities. And here we're measuring the median tree cover that the, the median household experiences. And so you can see the south of the US, southeast of the US has very high tree cover in places like Atlanta. And not surprisingly, when you're in the southwest of the US, uh, much lower tree cover, it's a, that's a climatic gradient, right? It's, it's arid and in the desert. This, this picture is maybe a little bit more interesting. So th this is showing you the difference, the inequality uh, between the tree cover percentage in the highest quartile and the lowest quartile. So things that are purple here have the greatest inequality in tree canopy cover. And you can see this, this strong concentration in cities in the Northeast. We think that that has to do with um, the structure of Northeastern cities. So these are some of the oldest cities in the US. 
They have very dense cores that were developed before the automobile was widespread. And then they actually tend to have very sprawly suburbs. So if you think about New York City, you can go everything from Manhattan up to Westchester County with a train ride. And Westchester County has very low, very large lots with single family homes. Um, those are the same urbanized area, the way the Census Bureau talks about these, these regions of commuting. And that the inequality in uh, land translates into an inequality in, in tree cover as well. Conversely, things that are blue, heading towards the blue or the turquoise, have very little tree cover inequality. And in fact, there are some cities where this trend reverses. Um, they tend to be very low density cities or cities near the coast, interestingly. Um, so there are some circumstances where being near an amenity like a coastline means that high income households are willing to pay more and willing to have smaller apartments even if they're near that beach um, frontage. Uh, whereas low income households in Florida, for instance, are sometimes away from the coast and thus have actually more tree canopy cover. Okay, so why, why does this inequality matter? Um, it affects that whole bundle of ecosystem services we talked about, but it, it especially affects heat. So we, we did one literature review as part of um, the Planting Healthy Air report. There, there've been others, but it, in that report, we found that just a row of street trees reduces summer temperatures on average by two to four degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and bigger patches of forest reduce, uh, have, have greater cooling intensities and also the effect extends out a little bit further. Some other work that my group did showed that trees in the US now save about 1200 lives a year. So there's substantial benefits from trees in terms of reducing mortality and morbidity and electricity consumption. Um, and certainly the Forest Service has been showing this with the, the iTree tool in a number of places. But this inequality data is showing that these benefits are quite unevenly distributed. So uh, on average, low income blocks across the whole US are 15% less treed and about three Fahrenheit hotter in terms of surface temperature. Um, I put the data there for Minneapolis, St. Paul, and, and you all are close to the average. Um, now, I want to acknowledge that particular blocks might be much different than this three degree Fahrenheit difference, but this is the average across the entire urbanized area. And uh, the Northeast, again, has the biggest surface temperature inequality. So Providence, Rhode Island, has the dubious distinction of having that biggest difference between the top quartile and the bottom quartile of around 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and all of the, the cities with huge temperature differentials are in the Northeast. So, so why does this matter? Well, other research from epidemiologists says that every degree Fahrenheit matters. So some work by Anderson and Bell, for instance, had that every one degree Fahrenheit increase in, uh, this is air temperature. It's not exactly the same as turf temperature, but they're correlated. Um, results in a two and a half degree, two and a half percent increase in mortality risk. So the kinds of differences you're seeing in Providence might be involved with, a, say, a 25% increase in mortality risk during heat wave, which is quite significant. And I see um, a comment in the chat. I'm going to not follow the chat too much, but please speak up if, if there's a technical problem or you have a question. Okay, so part two here. I, I'm going to transition to talking about COVID and Really, the only common theme between these two vignettes is around inequality and, and tree cover in nature. So this is very recent work. This came out in Nature Sustainability. Um, and we're dealing actually right now with a comment to the editor that someone made. But what we were trying to do here is answer two questions. First, how unequal is nature in cities in the US? We're looking not just at tree cover, but also park access here for all 486 urbanized areas in the US. And then question two is, you know, how does the geography of COVID-19 case counts relate to um, the geography of, of nature access? And I'll explain in a second why that's really interesting. We did this work, we were assembling data in 2021. We were pulling data from about 17 states that reported by zip code because we wanted fairly high spatial resolution data on COVID case counts. I want to acknowledge that the picture would look quite different now, right? Because we've lived through a period of first Delta and then Omicron. And so that the total 
case rate, number of cases per population is much, much higher now. Um, and so it's actually an interesting question how much our results still, still pertain. So first of all, what did we find to the first question? Where, who has nature in the US and how unequal is it? This just shows you the median access, uh, median NDVI and median park access for US urbanized areas. So NDVI here is a measure of greenness, relates a lot to tree cover. We're using it in this study because there's a, a, a whole body of literature in the health field that relates NDVI to health. And so we wanted to be able to, to reference and link into that. And then park access here is measuring the amount of parks within a, a certain distance that corresponds to about a 15 minute um, walk from, from people's homes. So there's a lot packed in this chart, but the way you read it is green areas are both high in DVI and high park access. And so you can see that in the Northeast of the US. Places that are orange are low in DVI, so not that much tree cover. Um, so it's true, especially in the Southwest, but they have a decent amount of park access. Things that are blue have a lot of tree cover, but not that much public parks. So you can see that's the domain of the Southeast of the US often. And then um, things that are white have not much of, of either. So you can see there's a really complex average geography of how much urbanized areas have access to, to nature. So what did we find um, as far as inequality across the US? So consistent with the, the results I showed previously, and again, I wanna acknowledge many, many other papers, we're showing that, um, uh, there's a strong relationship to, to both income and, um, and race. And the bar chart on the right here breaks out both those things. Um, so the, the x-axis is the income quartile. So the, uh, the, the zero is lowest income, three is the highest income. And, but it also breaks it out by uh, whether a neighborhood is majority people of color or majority um, non-Hispanic white. And so you can see that the, actually the big, difference in NDVI does relate to race and ethnicity, uh, but within that there is an income effect, especially for majority white, um, white neighborhoods. So this may matter, right, because we know from, from a lot of other health research that less um, NDVI is linked to poor mental health outcomes, um, more children be more overweight, etc. So whatever health benefits that nature is providing, tree cover is providing, are differentially provided in the US um, for both NDVI and then park access, which I didn't, I didn't show you data on park access. Okay, so our conceptual hypotheses going into this work was that um, inequality before the pandemic would be amplified during the pandemic. So poor neighborhoods, um, more often those, those households have frontline jobs, so they have service jobs or um, hospital jobs or you know, that, where they have to physically be there. So there would be then greater COVID exposure. They also often have poor health to start with, so more pre-existing conditions, and that can lead to worse COVID outcomes or more likelihood even to catch COVID. Um, and of course, low income neighborhoods are maybe less uh, able to deal with job losses or economic losses during the period of COVID and they have less nature access to start with. So we wanted to just see, is this hypothesis plausible? Um, is the geography of lower nature access um, reinforcing this geography of, uh, of inequality? And, and the answer broadly is yes. So to give you a visual picture of this, this is the Chicago um, metropolitan area, urbanized area. And um, you can see NDVI on the left, uh, again, this proxy for tree cover, uh, for the most part, greenness. Um, and then on the right is the case count. Uh, again, sort of circa mid 2000, 2021, um, this is the number of cases per 100,000. So you can see the concentration in uh, particular portions of, of central Chicago. So when you start to look just at the simple um, bivariate relationship between these two trends, it runs generally as we hypothesized. So first of all, look at the bar chart on the lower, lower left here. Um, if you divide households in the US up into quantiles based on NDVI, with one having um, the least greenness and four having the most greenness, what you see is that the households with less greenness actually by a fair amount have the most case count. 
Um, that, of course, though, also correlates with the, the, the results I was showing you around um, race and ethnicity. So majority non-Hispanic white neighborhoods have more greenness. Um, and um, people of color majority neighborhoods have higher COVID case counts. So at least at the level of association, it's pretty clear that these patterns are reinforcing each other. So what's interesting is if you build a statistical model, even after you correct for um, factors like uh, race and ethnicity, um, you still have a significant effect of NDVI on the observed amount of the, of the, the COVID case rate. That is not the case, interestingly, for park access, which is statistically doesn't have an effect here. So if you had one variable in the US to predict COVID case counts, it would be the, the proportion people of color. That's a very strong predictor of who had COVID in the US. But if you were going to choose a second variable, your second variable would be NDVI. It's a, it's a better predictor than things like population density um, or income, which, which I think is really interesting. And the two charts on the right give you a sense of what this means spatially. Um, so in, in terms of th these are posterior predictions from our statistical model, um, there is a strong effect of proportion of people of color, but then there's a more moderate effect of greenness on the observed case counts. So uh, I don't want to go so far as to claim that uh, there's some causal relationship there. I think the science is really short on that. Uh, but at the very least, places in the US that, that had less nature also had more COVID. And it seems likely that there's some uh, implications of that for at least um, people's life when they were sheltering in place, right? Um, and, and there's something else worth looking in there. There's been a couple of papers now that have talked about this relationship between nature and, and COVID outcomes. All right, so I'm almost at the end of my talk. Uh, I just wanted to return to you. How big is this problem and how do we solve it? This table gives you a sense of how many trees we might need to plant to solve the problem. So I'm showing you here that, the, again, those same population density categories from very low to high. And the far right column now is, is the total across all population density categories. The majority of people live in, in some of the medium and high density categories, but the majority of area is very much in the very low and, and low density categories. The next row down talks about the tree cover gap and then the how much extra tree cover you would need to close that gap. And we made sort of a rough estimate here, first order estimate of the trees required to close that gap. And it's roughly 62 million trees that are missing from low income neighborhoods that you would need to add to reach um, the tree cover that's in high income neighborhoods of equivalent density. So something we're trying to do here is say, you know, calculate away the, the density difference and just say, if we wanna make two neighborhoods that are similarly dense, similarly green, how many more trees do we need in the US? Because there's still a difference in, in tree cover. So, uh, there are many ways you could value ecosystem services, uh, and I'm trying to work with the Natural Capital Project now to think um, about ecosystem service value and, and what this inequality means for it. Compensatory value is one of them. So roughly speaking, there's $56 billion less in compensatory value uh, in, of trees in poor neighborhoods than there would be in rich neighborhoods, all else being equal. That is much bigger, obviously, than the cost of planting trees to, to close this gap, which is $18 billion. So a lot of money, but in the context of something like the US federal budget, not, not that much. This is a, the kind of problem that we in, in the US could solve if we wanted. And, and I guess I wanted to end on that note. You know, I presented a lot of US level data and numbers. One of the joys of working at the Nature Conservancy is getting to work directly with tree plantings like this one. Um, and translate those big abstract numbers into, okay, we're gonna go plant hundred trees today, right? Um, this is a tree planting in Louisville. So that's the scale at which solutions happen. Um, trees are planted and maintained, Ma maintenance is really crucial, in municipalities, right? In particular neighborhoods. And so the solution to tree inequality um, has to also be local. It has to involve communities and, and urban foresters um, planting trees to correct this inequality. That's the kind of thing that excites me. Um, 
to do this science and, and give talks like this. And I hope it excited you a little bit. Um, and I think uh, with that, I will stop and um, turn it back over to the, the host of this meeting. Great, thank you for the talk. Um, we have one question in the chat as of right now. Um, I can read that out here. So it will uh, be recorded as well. Uh, thanks, Dr. McDonald, enjoying the subject and uh, talk a lot. Here's my question. I've always thought of encouraging urban tree planting as a positive feedback. The cooling and shading reduces heating and cooling needs this summer, which reduces climate emissions, which will decrease heating and cooling needs further. Is this a fair read? If so, why has it been difficult to leverage win-win elements like this in policy making? Yeah, that's a good question. Yes, I think it is a win-win solution in that sense. So trees um, absolutely reduce uh, electricity use for cooling um, and, and sometimes uh, have heating energy gains as well. And that does reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, if you're going to make that win-win argument to policymakers, you have to be ready to also speak about other solutions, right? So um, there's people who work on cool roofs, so just painting roofs white. <laughs> that has a much higher return on investment, for instance, than tree planting because it's it, it's fairly it's a cheap way to reduce energy consumption. Um, and in cold parts of the country, there's a big focus on insulation. Right? that also has a really high return, return on investment. So there's, there's many ways you could reduce residential energy consumption, but I think it's fair to say that tree cover is one of them. And, and I think I've worked with cities that are trying to use that as an extra justification for tree planting. The other point I wanna make though, is there's, a, a, there's my nightmare scenario around climate change, which is the flip of this happening. So as we see more intense heat waves and droughts, many cities are losing a lot of their tree canopy cover. And that means that then households will spend more on cooling in the summer, um, which then makes climate change worse. So that's sort of a lose-lose scenario. Um, and I do think there's a risk of, of some of that happening as we start to see um, extreme heat events and especially drought events that uh, sometimes wind events that kill a lot of urban tree canopy. Who else? Anyone else have a question or a thought? I can ask a quick question here. Uh, so I was curious if you could explain more of uh, like the park component of the project. Like what did you consider a park and uh, I guess uh, rationale kind of uh, in including that? Yeah. Um, so what, what we, what we did, and I point people to the paper for more technical detail, was try to pull together a couple publicly available data sets that describe um, publicly accessible parks. And we did that because um, when we started to overlay them and compare them, none of them captured all of the public accessible parks. So in the US, um, there's, um, the, I'm trying to remember which ones. We, the, we, there was a ESRI data set. There was also, I think, the protected area data set, unless I'm getting that wrong. I always get the US version confused with the global version. Um, uh, and there was the TPL data set as well, which is one of the better ones. Um, so our goal was to have a fairly broad survey of public accessible green space. Um, so, so why did we do that? Well, because there was already this other literature on um, inequality with respect to park access. And for COVID, you know, there are reasons to think that for people who were, um, for my own, myself in DC, like going to a green space nearby when I was working at home and my kids weren't at school and was a really uh, a big mental stress reliever. And so we we're trying to understand, well, who has access to a nearby park? that's publicly accessible. Um, I keep stressing publicly accessible because um, in terms of sometimes in people define open space to also include undeveloped land, basically. So suburban areas definitely always have more um, undeveloped land, right? It's, it's actually not always the case. Some urban areas 
some city cores have more public accessible parkland than suburban areas. So in suburban areas, you tend to get high, you, people have backyards, right? But they don't have public accessible parkland. Um, so that was why we wanted to sort of compare and contrast it with NDVI. Um, and I think it's really interesting that as a predictor of COVID case rates, NDVI is a better predictor. Um, and park access does not seem to uh, be a predictor. But that doesn't mean, of course, that there aren't other reasons. It's good to have a park nearby. Uh, and there's still structural inequality in who has access to parks uh, in the US, for sure. Oh, Chris, you're on, uh, you're on mute there. There's a couple of yes, questions. Okay. In. <laughs> uh, I'll read this first one off here. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, do you think, uh, do you think that not only the tree cover and access to nearby green spaces, but also the quality of the urban forest paths, which is in ecological senses, structure, biodiversity, integrity, of ecosystem functions, could also be unequal among socioeconomic gradients? That's a good question. Uh, probably, but I don't. I don't know for sure. Um, there is. Uh, th there's probably different answers for different questions. Ecosystem function, um, uh, well, and especially ecosystem services matter. Proximity matters a lot. So <clears throat> sometimes patches of nature in cities can be very valuable because uh, there's a lot of people nearby, even if it's not. Uh, natural nature or biodiverse uh, kind of natural habitat. Um, it is in general true that um, as you have more population density nearby and or smaller patches, um, you have usually more changes in biodiversity, more changes in ecological functioning. Um, now, does any of that relate to, yeah, COVID or urban heat island? I'm not sure. Um, there, there's a complex literature around, for instance, biodiversity and health and questions about whether more biodiverse nature is better for people's health. There's a couple hypotheses. One of them is the hygiene hypothesis, this idea that kids, for instance, that are exposed to more biodiverse spaces and more germs actually develop stronger immune systems. Um, so there's a number of reasons to think that having more biodiverse areas nearby might be better for your health, but that's... Uh, I still think maybe still an emerging area of research. Sweet. And we have another one here. Uh, so how do you think about slash approach cultural preference, preferences for different kinds, forms, and densities of urban vegetation? Do these show in your analyses? Yeah, before I do that, I just want to um, give a plus one to what Eric said. Um, yeah, Eric, we have often used our tree at CNC, so really grateful for that tool is there um, and would point folks to that as ways to calculate everything from the benefit of one tree in your backyard to trees in a whole city, if you have an interest in that. Okay, um, yeah, to this question from Samuel. So in these analyses I was showing you, um, I, we're not really thinking about different cultural preferences for different uh, kinds or, or types of vegetation in, because in a sense, what we're looking at is distributional equity, right? So what is the distribution of tree cover with respect to um, race or ethnicity? What is the distribution of tree cover, for instance, relative to income? Um, and I suppose we're focusing in that in part because my lab group tends to do landscape analyses. And, and so things like cultural preferences are extremely important, but also harder to map, um, but really, really interesting and important, of course. Um, and I think that manifests um, in, in different ways. So for instance, uh, if anyone has seen some of the research in, in Baltimore, some really good studies about how some low-income neighborhoods have really mixed feelings or negative feelings about increases in tree canopy cover in, in Baltimore. Um, and certainly some of the places TNC works, there are concerns about green gentrification. And so we have to 
work with communities when we're thinking about increasing the tree cover to also think about issues around um, affordable housing or do it in, in partnership with those groups. Um, and then at a really different international kind of scale, we're talking in a U, I, this talk is in a US context where um, suburbs are wealthier, the city center is poor, um, our cities have a particular structure. I gave a version of this talk in France and um, people really pushed back because in, in many European cities, uh, and this is sort of true in New York City as well, in many European cities, the city center is the richest part of the city. Right? If you're a rich household in Paris, you live in Paris proper. And if you're poor, you actually live in the suburbs. So what's interesting is in many European cities, not all, but many, this seems flipped to some extent. Um, and some of the lower income households or immigrant households um, have higher tree cover. Uh, so that's not exactly a cultural preference, but it's like a differential way that we've structured our cities. Um, yeah, and I guess finally, I want to acknowledge, like, I'm presenting this sort of rosy picture that tree cover provides benefits, and I feel like on aggregate, that's true, there's a good literature around, you know, nature has these benefits to health, but there are definitely cultural contexts where people view um, nature, especially spaces that are perceived as unsafe, really negatively, right, and so there's a good literature, for instance, on concerns about crime in, um, parks and, and other open spaces, especially those that are not maintained well. Um, and those are real concerns with communities we interact with who, who might want, for instance, like um, uh, to, to light an area at night, to clear out undergrowth and have a very sparse canopy because there's a perception it's safer. Um, so, so yes, Samuel, it's a good question, and I'm rambling in my answer because cultural preferences relate in sort of multiple different ways. Sweet. Um, we have a nice comment from uh, UMet Extension uh, person here, uh, talking about how. The Department of Forestry is currently hiring uh, urban forestry pro professor, and uh, there isn't any kind of outreach or extension time allocation for the position. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, I think it's great that there's a focus now at um, UMN, um, uh, and I've worked with some, some folks at the university around this issue. Um, and I do think there's an uptick, especially in the US around, focus on um, issues related to inequality in tree cover specifically or nature more generally. Um, then a number of high profile papers recently around um, redlining and how that relates to patterns of tree cover, but also air quality. There was a good paper recently. Um, I didn't talk much about redlining in, in this talk, but that's uh, another important historical process that layers on top of some of the structural issues of our cities that, that are there, um, where for reasons of both explicit racism and, and sometimes um, uh, implicit racism that, that's a little separate from redlining, but both of those things reinforce often inequalities in our cities um, and reinforce this, this pattern of tree cover inequality. So you're saying, I'm seeing an explosion of interest in this topic. Um, I'm seeing some cities starting to take actions and prioritize tree planting into neighborhoods that are less served right now and have less tree cover. But I'm also seeing lots of cities, to be honest, that still have very little capacity to uh, plan for or plant or maintain their tree canopy cover and um, tend to do it in a somewhat ad hoc fashion. So even Washington, DC, when I lived in DC, um, certainly has great maps of where there's tree cover and where there's not. Uh, and they know that, that Ward 7 and 8, for instance, in DC, um, the lower income neighborhoods have much less tree cover, but they also still operate some by where people request tree planting. So if you look at the map of where they're doing tree planting, it tends to be wealthier neighborhoods because they're getting more requests in those neighborhoods. And it's, it's a little easier to plant in those neighborhoods because they're a little less, they have lower impervious surface. Um, so, I think many cities are still trying to figure out um, how to start correcting this, this injustice, yeah. 
think we're we out of questions any. here. Yeah, yeah we, we might be. So I would jump in. Um, so I've seen data about emerald ash borer and its impact on canopies and negative health outcomes of those. And, and so I, I do think there's a lot of potential in the space to frame it around uh, human health. And you mentioned a couple of communities are doing that. And I'm wondering if you have any insight on what has worked or hasn't worked for communities that have tried to frame this urban green space equity issue around human health. Hmm. Um, that's a great question. Uh, and it, it probably varies a little bit depending on the, the context, the governance context. And so to start maybe internationally and give people a broader perspective on that, some governments that have nationalized healthcare systems have seemed more aggressive in dealing with this linkage, right? So I mentioned that, that project in Melbourne, there was a fairly direct transition then to the health agency in that state in Australia to talk about what well, here might be the health implications of tree cover inequality. And um, because most of the health costs are borne by the state, th there's a, at least it's um, on both sides, like the, the people, it's both, the, it's the government in both cases that would pay the, the health costs and the, um, uh, that would have to plant trees. And, and so something similar happens in the UK or New Zealand, which where there's been a bit more progress for things like nature prescriptions, right? And doctors prescribing people to go to nature. Um, in the US, because we have this system of private healthcare, um, it's a little more complicated because um, there, people talk about the wrong pocket problem, right? So the agency, that would have to pay for tree planting is often a municipal agency. Um, it could be sometimes the Department of Transportation if there's tree trees, or it could be a natural resource agency. And then you have a different agency, usually at the county level in the US, that has a health responsibility. And for one thing, they're different skill sets, right? The, the people in the health agency don't think about forestry and vice versa. They're operating at different scales, and they don't have a great mechanism to exchange money. Um, and so the, you see some cities taking a first step of just joint planning between the two. So Toronto comes to mind of a city where they, they tried to do that. Um, New York City also comes to mind um, as a place where uh, it, it's a bigger city, a very well resourced city in many ways, um, in terms of their government capacity. And so there's been some really good science using New York City healthcare data directly showing this effect of um, lack of tree cover on um, deaths and, and morbidity during heat waves. And then because of that, they, they while well, they tried in the plant a million trees program, and now they're trying with the next million trees effort to direct tree planting to places um, like in the Bronx or Queens that, that have less tree cover. Um, so big cities are in some ways like an exception in the US because they do manage healthcare and they manage trees. And so they can sort of solve that public policy challenge. Um, but it gets, it gets harder for small cities in the US where there's, there's often no forester, right? And there's very little capacity to plan. Um, so I, I don't know the magic solution. And Angela, I'd love thoughts from your perspective on like, yeah, what seems to be working to, to plan solutions to this issue. Yeah, I don't. I I, I don't know what seems to be working. I will say, I mean, so I was realizing, realizing this is a group of um, Fish, Wildlife, Cons, Bio people and not forestry people. So mm -hmm. I will say, I think there's generally an effort in Minnesota to get our parks within 10 to 15 um, walking minutes of our constituency. And so when you looked at those national maps, there were a lot, Minnesota looked better in those maps than it does in some other racial disparity maps. Um, and that's because we do have some uh, nation, nationally renowned park systems and some real priorities and real great space. Um, I do worry though about, we also have our big cities. So uh, St. Paul, Minneapolis, the Twin Cities Metro by and large, and then Duluth, Mankato, Rochester have designated foresters, right? So urban foresters that kind of run those shops. And by and large, I think they're a really great group of professionals. It's all of those 500 plus small municipalities that I really think we, we struggle to serve well, um, but they're, their disparities in some of those communities, I suspect, uh, are pretty bad. I mean, we have some large 
uh, communities with a lot of refugees really new Minnesotans and I haven't seen those numbers but again having such limited access to resources I will say if this group hasn't heard uh, the DNR has um, 50 uh, forestry corps members that they're trying to get out on the landscape this year so that is really exciting opportunity and I know in some communities they've certainly been able to do tree inventories which is often that first step to equitable planting and then planting and a bunch of other things so uh, but it's really connecting those dots and and making uh, and getting getting the contribution of resources. And so, like I was the one that dropped in the the lack of resources uh, for outreach around this at the university, and it, it it deeply worries me. And I don't I don't know what to do about it. Um, but I feel like if people don't know, then we can't ever address the problem. So hence my dropping in. Not sure if I helped. Might have just. No, that, that was that was really interesting. And one thing I thought of as you talked, which comes out of the the tree inequality work I was doing, but is worth talking about, is much of the literature on tree inequality focuses at the municipal scale, right? So how much is inequality within D, Washington D.C. proper, right, or New York City proper? And that's important, and it's a scale of governance, right? But what's interesting when you look at the overall urbanized area is that the inequality is greater. And so, so why is that? So US metro regions are very fragmented, um, certainly by global standards, and, and meaning there might be hundreds of municipalities in the greater New York City area. And um, they are very unequal in terms of income and ethnicity, et cetera. And they don't share resources generally between municipalities. And so, um, one of the things we've been encouraging urban areas to do is not just think about inequality in the city proper, but sort of the overall region, um, because some of, like in the DC area, uh, where I've looked at the data more, there are some suburban towns that are lower income that have some of the worst tree access and park access numbers. And so, and they're very under-resourced towns that probably get less attention in a public policy sense than um, something like the District of Columbia. Yeah, and I mean, I, I assume this group has seen, but there's some really great information about redlining here in the Twin Cities. I would have to dig, maybe someone else can dig and find it. But I mean, we definitely have a, a, um, a very ugly and sad past around redlining in Minnesota that I think we're just starting to come to terms with. But there are maps now um, that can help us at least better understand that. And, and I know that some of our municipal communities are really trying to put in trees in these historically underserved neighborhoods. So, but if, if the whole community's trees ac accesses are generally neglected, then that, that imbalance just persists as it has always. Thank you. Sure, yeah, no, it, it's a hard challenge. I mean, the other angle we haven't talked about tonight but which is important are trees on private lands, right? And so especially in um, suburban or exurban neighborhoods, uh, which again can be high or low income, um, private trees on private land become much more important than trees on public land, and just because there's more land area and, and private land. And what you see is that, for instance, renter occupied um, places have less tree cover than owner occupied generally. And that even in owner occupied households, um, richer households tend to invest more in tree planting, which makes sense, right? They have more disposable income. And so um, there's a whole other discussion about how you incentivize households to plant on, on private land. I suspect they're gonna cut us off soon. Yeah. But <laughs> if, not, if not, I'll respond. Because the other thing about that, and you sort of alluded to this, I mean, we're losing a lot of trees at Time World Ash Borer. And we have lost, but very much as you said, like in your worst case scenario for climate change, the trees will go and then we'll get higher heating costs. And frankly, I think we're seeing that because we're, we're losing a large, large percent of mature shade producing trees. And even if they get replanted, which they may or may not, it'll be years before they offer those same services. And I think in particularly in those renter owned they they aren't getting treated. I mean, emerald ash borer is a treatable problem, but only if the landowner is willing to treat. And I think, I don't have data, but my suspicion is fewer people that rent are getting those trees treated, their trees are going, are they getting replaced? And so in some ways, I think we're already starting to see the earlies of your worst case in certain pockets. And I don't know that we've done a good job of managing that on private parcels. Okay, you can close us off, it's one o'clock. Yes. Uh yeah, thanks a bunch, Dr. McDonald, for coming to talk. Uh, and we will have a, another seminar next week. So uh, tune in next week for that.
and happy Friday, everybody. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. It was a pleasure. Have a good day, everybody. Cheers.